Today we're talking about Ridley Scott's Napoleon, the director's cut. So recently, Apple TV released a new version of the movie that adds an additional 48 minutes, making the already lengthy movie about three and a half hours long. So today we're going to break down that version of it, but we're going to do things a little different today. I'm Gil, the voice and the writer for One Take, and I'm here with my brother, Daniel. You usually tell me what to say. Oh, uh, Say hello, Daniel. Hello, Daniel. <laughs> great, great. We're <laughs> off to a great start. The different thing is not that Daniel's on. The different thing today is that Daniel's going to be running the show. He's going to be the Napoleon today, the captain. And it's, you're sort of a history buff, right, Daniel? That's right. You're usually more into like ancient Roman history, though. Yes, but the French during this time period were very obsessed with ancient Roman history as well. They were the Daniels of their time. All right, is this, is this the point now where I'll officially hand it off to you? Yeah, I just want to say, do you know how stressful it is to try to recap something for the master recapper himself? It's very stressful. <laughs> and you're not starting with something easy. You're starting with a <laughs> three and a half hour movie. Uh, okay, so wait, first overall thoughts. Gil, would you like to share your overall thoughts on the movie before we get into it? Sure, Daniel. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Yeah, I remember the the first time we saw this movie in theaters, the original cut, I walked away having really enjoyed the experience, but recognizing the movie has a lot of flaws. It's similar to how I felt about Prometheus, where it has issues at a writing story level, but it's directed by Ridley Scott. It has great production value. It's great to look at. And in both examples, Prometheus and Napoleon, they are in genres that I really like, which don't get a lot of exposure today. In one case, sci-fi horror. In this case, a sort of historical epic. So this movie, like I said, great production value, great to look at. It's in a genre I love, has an epic, awesome score that I was humming for weeks after seeing the movie. But I recognize it's got a lot of flaws at the story level. Um, basically what people were saying about it at the time is that it's sort of Napoleon's life by bullet points. It's just going through, here are the things that happened and we're going to render them in very high quality on the big screen. But I don't think it really finds a narrative of his life. People say the movie doesn't take a point of view on Napoleon. I think that's partially true. There There are aspects of the character where they definitely take a point of view. Um, But there are other aspects where they don't, and I don't necessarily think that's an issue. But in lieu of that, I wish they gave us more information, gave us more insights into his motivation, into Josephine's motivation. So it would give us something to chew on and come to our own conclusions. But a lot of this stuff, I would say overall, the, the overwhelming feeling I left with, aside from I enjoyed that just as a immersive trip through history, uh, what I felt was that it was somewhat shallow. And it just didn't give us enough to even come to our own conclusions on who was Napoleon, why did he do these things, what drove him, etc. Yeah, I I basically had the same reaction. My one liner on this is just going to be, it was just a bunch of stuff that happened. Like that, that's what the movie felt like. It's just like just a bunch of stuff that happened. And, you know, it sort of makes a little more sense to me now that I've like tried to bullet out everything that happened in the movie. But it's still just a bunch of stuff that happened. I love the time period. And so I can just spend hours like vibing to the movie and liking the scenery. But it just it really struggled from a storytelling perspective. And right, we're going to be talking about the director's cut today. Did I even hope the director's cut was going to fix the issues from the main movie? Like, not really, because it's such fundamental storytelling problems. There was no way it could solve it. And it didn't. And to be honest, I don't even really know what it's such a long movie. I don't really remember what's different in the director's cut versus the original. But I think there are a few things we'll talk through as we go through it that are different. But yeah, I don't know. Just got got more footage, more time. I wouldn't say the director's cut, I think, is ever so slightly an improvement because there were and I, I found a website that actually at first what I was doing, I was watching the director's cut on one monitor and then I had the original on the other one. And so I was kind of stepping through the movies. And then where they differed, I would just go back and forth. And then I found a website where somebody already did that. They have every timestamp of additional footage. Uh, but there are definitely some things where you get a little bit of additional context. And some really interesting ones, 
especially around Josephine. I can point them out as we go through the recap. There's only one in particular that totally changed my perspective on her somewhat. I'm like, I can't believe they took this part out. And uh, that'll be a little hook. You can wait till we get to that part. I'm excited to hear that too. All right. We have the intro. It is 1789, the revolution in France. People are driven by misery to revolution and brought back to revolution to mi- by, brought back by revolution <laughs> to misery. The French have I would become say disillusioned. Just, the, the way you got tongue twisted there, it is a confusing sentence. So what Daniel's reading right now is this, it's like the opening crawl of the movie. It's got some introductory text and it's like they're led to revolution by misery and they're led by revolution to misery. And I was trying to figure out the rhyme and like the, I was like, wait, so is revolution good? Oh, no, no, it's bad, but it's also good. <laughs> I was getting so mixed up on it. Yeah, I mean, the historical context here is like the French Revolution had a lot of ups and downs, a lot of good things going for it, a lot of bad things, right? Where we pick up in this movie is during the Reign of Terror, which, in case you couldn't guess from the name, was kind of a bad part of the French Revolution. Uh, without reading the rest of the crawl, I, basically what it says is you got the anti royalists. They're in charge. They're going to soon send King Louis the 16th, who they've been ousting, to death, as well as 11,000 of his supporters. The crawl doesn't say this, but they're also just killing like tens of thousands of people that they accuse of being against the revolution. Uh, And they're about to go and kill the Queen of France, Marie Antoinette. At the same time, an ambitious Corsican gunnery officer named Napoleon Bonaparte seeks a promotion. We then have some happy French music playing as Marie Antoinette is captured and decapitated by guillotine. Uh, And then the camera turns to Napoleon and we see the title card, Napoleon. Yeah. How did you read the look on Napoleon's face? Because basically, starting with the movie's point of view on the revolution, like you said, it's starting at the point where things have taken a dark turn. It's one of those things where I'm like, ah, I heard Daniel said something about um, bad about the revolution. Next day, you'd be under the guillotine. And actually, by the way, what's our official stance? Are we going guillotine or guillotine? Oh, they say guillotine in the movie, but I am too used to saying guillotine. And so, you know what? I'm not going to commit either way. I'm going to say guillotine when I remember. I'm going to say guillotine when I feel like it. I'm going to go guillotine for obvious reasons. <laughs> it's got my name in it. I like that. Uh, but you, you, if, if you think about um, when this movie picks up, right, you, you badmouth someone, you're like, oh, I hear they said something bad about the revolution. And it's like that would be enough to get them under the guillotine the next day. In this crowd, they're all cheering as Marie Antoinette or Marie Antoinette. Mary or Marie? Marie, I'm pretty Marie. sure. <laughs> I don't want to turn this into how do you pronounce each thing <laughs> as we go. That'll be the last time I ask. But it definitely puts you on the side against the revolutionaries. Because all you have is the opening text that tells you about some of the stuff that drove them to this. But visually, all you see is a woman having rotten vegetables tossed at her and then executed. And you're with her the entire time. So I think just viscerally, it's impossible not to feel, wow, she is surrounded by savages. And I think that's partly to put you in Napoleon's point of view. Because my read on his face was a little bit of ambivalence. He's kind of unamused, and I'm not sure. Is he, is he disgusted by what he's seeing, like he's above all this, or does he just not care? So, I mean, that's something we, we are going to need to talk throughout the movie of Napoleon's relation to violence. But, you know, historically, Napoleon was, init- at least initially, pretty far onto the Jacobin side. So he actually did some public writing in support of them. The Jacobins are sort of the, the farthest left radicals led by Robespierre, who will eventually run this whole reign of terror. Now, at some point during that, Napoleon goes away from them. And and that's now that's the extent of my knowledge, right? How sympathetic he was to this sort of violence. I'm not sure. The stance on the movie, I sort of took his reaction as ambivalence. Like he's sorry, not ambivalence, indifferent. I actually felt he thinks he's above the crowd, but I don't think he cares that somebody's getting decapitated. And I think the the crawl tries to indicate that to us because it's about all this horrible stuff that's happening. Starvation, murders, and then you just have an ambitious Corsican gunnery seeking a promotion, right? Like there's all this going on. He wants to get promoted. It, it might've just been because we literally just talked about Joker. And it's the same actor. 
But yeah. it's it's like it's sort of both characters, Napoleon and Joker, have the same stance about the angry mob. It's purely opportunity. In Joker's case, it's, oh, I always wanted attention. I don't really care about all the politics of it, but now people are paying attention to me. And Napoleon, well, this is a great opportunity for a promotion. And we next move on to Napoleon's promotion. And by the way, this is going to be Napoleon's first meeting in the movie with Paul Barat. I indicate that because we're going to have three uh, scenes like this that are almost identical. So <laughs> Napoleon, we see Napoleon walk into the National Convention where Robespierre is justifying the execution of Marie Antoinette that just happened and everybody is cheering on. We then have Paul Barat, who is the commissioner of the French army, explaining to Napoleon and his brother, Laris Strong, sorry, yes. <laughs> I mean <laughs> Lucien Bonaparte, uh, that the British Navy has taken the port of Toulon Forgive all of my French pronunciation. I mean, just say it the way Joaquin Phoenix in the movie, he just says Toulon. Okay. So I was like, I just basically, I hear different pronunciations throughout the movie. The one that sounds easiest to say, that's the one I grab. And so the British Navy has taken that port. Half the French Navy is trapped there. This historically is an extremely important port for the French, and they cannot afford to lose, lose those ships. And so Paul Barat assigns Napoleon the task of taking back this fort. So we see a pretty cool night attack on Toulon. So first of all, Napoleon is writing to his brother, Lucien. Uh, and he's saying, you know, his motivation here, that he doesn't want them to be seen as Corsican ruffians if they fail. And he also references their mother's ambition for them. You know, this is going to be important later on. And also just want to point out, historically, Corsica was only recently part of France. And so this is part of Napoleon's character is he is a total outsider and not the kind of person who traditionally would have been able to rise under the old regime within France. But because of this revolution, he does have a chance to rise. This is some of the stuff where I'm confused why it's not in the movie. Yes, we get we get one sentence here that gives you a little bit of insight into his motivation. There's some insecurity around the fact that he's Corsican and would not have been allowed to be promoted until this revolution. Uh, there's a mention of his mother, and I understand she was an important figure in his life. So there's these little seeds that it doesn't give you enough to chew on to think about his motivation. It gives you enough to go on to Google after the movie or go to chat GPT and be like, hey, is there something about Napoleon's mother? So it gives you like the seeds that I, and this is an example where I think more context would have been helpful. So th these are exactly my complaints about the movie. The, the other thing, something I was comparing this to at different points was I was just thinking about Napoleon, this extremely ambitious figure, right? The movie talks all the time about his ambition, right? Let's just compare it to like Hamilton. Hamilton, super ambitious guy, and we see it in the musical, right? Like he is working very hard to rise up. Something I felt was lacking throughout this movie was- Not enough musical numbers. <laughs> Actually, there were some good musical numbers in this movie. That's true. And we'll get to see Joaquin Phoenix sing in about two weeks in Joker uh, too. <laughs> yes. so. But I don't feel I actually saw an ambitious Napoleon working hard to rise up. I see him rising, but and we'll we'll talk about this throughout the movie, but I felt it they portrayed it as if he's just stumbling into opportunities. Three times, Paul Barad just calls him to a meeting and promotes him and gives him a chance. That, first of all, I don't think that's historically accurate, right? I think Napoleon is conspiring, like very actively to rise up because, you know, he doesn't want to be this Corsican ruffian, like all this stuff. And that's critical to his character, but we don't see it. Like, I just think that was missing from the movie. Yeah, you don't see his personal ambition. You hear about it a few times. And I remember one of the feelings I had the first time I watched this movie is I don't understand why he succeeded. I can't tell if mm -hmm. he's like a brilliant tactician or he's just stumbling his way to the top and it's right place, right time. Because we'll get to an example where it's like, there's a bunch of revolutionaries, they're rising up, what do we do? And he's like, what if we attack them? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know, it reminds me of Dune 2 where it's like, ah, bomb them, brilliant. Like, yeah. Well, if I can think of it, then I'm just not going to be that impressed that Napoleon did. So like you said, the feeling I'm left with in the movie is that he's just stumbling his way to the top. I know that's not true. And on my second viewing, where I paused every 10 minutes to try and look up 
and get a better understanding of the historical context. Now I think I have a better feel for what he's good at, what he's not good at. And it's, it's, there's seeds of it in the movie where now I can look back and see, okay, I can connect some dots. But I don't think the movie gives you enough to connect the dots yourself. Yeah. It, you know, Napoleon is considered one of the greatest, if not the greatest, like military genius in history. Like an incredible general, incredibly loved by his army, right? Like he generates insane loyalty. And we see signs of these things, but like not really. Well, anyway. We get to this cool night battle. Basically, the plan is to take the fort's guns and fire onto the British ships in the harbor. We have this cool battle at night. The British seem drunk. They're singing. They're having fun. Uh, Napoleon has his troops blow a hole in the wall. They, they, they break through the hole. They climb up the wall. There's some cool fighting. Napoleon leads the charge. And they win. They take the cannons. They fire on the harbor. We have triumphant music. They win. And the next morning... Uh, Napoleon has his troops assembled, Paul Barat is there, and awards Napoleon the rank of Brigadier General. And we get a cool line. Napoleon says, I promised you brilliant successes, and I have kept my word. And Paul Barat has this sort of too cool for school smile that he gives all the time to Napoleon. Uh, and that's Napoleon's first promotion that we see. Uh, first off, the battle looks incredible. That's one thing you could say. I feel like we don't have to repeat that over and over throughout the movie. All the battles look amazing. And so weirdly glossed over. If you invest that much money into making these incredible battles, it feels like we go into them with almost no context and then just sort of wrap them up pretty quickly. Uh, but there's that horse that gets hit right in the chest, Napoleon's horse, like incredible. Uh, now, one reason why the battles might not be as emphasized as much as you'd expect is that apparently the writer, I watched an interview with him just this morning, and he said that when he wrote the movie, he was expecting a very small budget, like $30 million. So he's like, I didn't emphasize the battles because I didn't think we'd be able to afford it. And I'm like, should they not have had that conversation? <laughs> because it sounds like it would have really changed how you wrote the movie if you had some idea how much money you were getting. And why did you think that? It's directed by Ridley Scott. <laughs> it's about Napoleon. It's a huge, epic movie. And you're like, ah, they're going to give us a lower budget than Joker. And you end up getting a few hundred million dollars to make a movie and you don't think to do some rewrites? <laughs> well, I think they probably, let's be honest, they probably did yeah. adjust a few things once they got that money. But I just found that and a lot of times these little things slip out of Hollywood and you're like, what? But you know, that, that also just sounds like, you know, those like the issues screenplays have when they're sort of written by committee. This also, just that little anecdote gives you the vibe of sort of written by piecemeal right is oh they get a bigger budget so okay let's put some bat like bigger battles in it i i think i don't know it just doesn't seem the best way to write a movie <laughs> uh but the, yeah the battle i'll say this again it looked amazing it looked amazing napoleon looks nervous which i remembered seeing that in the first movie and thought it was an interesting choice to the point of him pursuing ambition i would have loved to see him struggle a lot more in the lead up to this. You know, we see some preparation, but it doesn't feel that hard for him. Then he seems nervous during the battle, but he pushes through and look, he charges, he leads from the front. It's cool. It still feels a little easy. The, the British seem caught pretty easily. I don't really know what happened in the real battle, but there's no reconnaissance. When can you move a full army right up against the fort? Like we see this later in the movie, there are scouts everywhere the british are not incompetent and yeah okay well we have reference to them not knowing how to fight land wars okay maybe that's part of it but i would have liked to see bigger obstacles in napoleon's way i think that would have made this also we we would have connected more with him yeah i do think i mean joaquin phoenix great actor doesn't get a, a ton of range because i feel like for the rest of the movie it's it's always Napoleon trying to act very calm and confident. This is I this is I think the only time where we see him nervous, and I think he really does a, a great job portraying it. He's you see him like breathing heavily, and then once they get the cannons, you see he fi he visibly calms and he's like, okay, we're it's working out the way it's supposed to. One one other thing from the battle though that I love and I love it throughout the movie is just Napoleon's hand gestures. Just seeing him give a command. I don't know why. I find it really satisfying in battle when he gives a nod or whatever and you see the next phase of it begin. So that was yeah, cool. I found that satisfying. And then anytime you get uh sort of like a helicopter shot and you see the formations happening, 
and to see all those people move, it, it's, it's great. Okay, next we meet Josephine. She is a noble woman whose husband had fought for the revolution, though was executed, like many people around this time. She is brought to a prison with very Les Mis vibes uh, for being a noble, basically, uh, where she is told by a friend to cut her hair short so that the guillotine doesn't get caught on her hair and to get pregnant to delay her execution. Both of these things she does. Uh, so that stuff is new for the director's cut. Really? Yeah, I remember we in, in the movie, in the original version, you spend very little time with Josephine. Like here, you see her at home and the uh, officials come in and start threatening her five-year-old daughter for information. Like that stuff wasn't in the original cut. Uh, and, and it does, I mean, like I said, uh, with the execution of Marie Antoinette, this does really set you uh, on the side against the revolutionaries because you don't see any of what drove them to this behavior. You only see the bad stuff, like them threatening a five-year-old girl. But it, yeah, it tells you a little bit more about where Josephine is coming from. Uh, a lot of this stuff just made me sick to my stomach. Like just casually, because there's, there's different ways you can approach knowledge of uh, execution. So she meets this woman who knows that she's going to be killed soon, but she's like, uh, you know, don't worry, uh, you have a thin neck, so it'll be over fast. You know, the king's neck was fat, so it didn't go through all the way at first. Uh, you know, cut your hair short so the guillotine doesn't get caught in your hair. And just listening to these, this cold discussion of the logistics of her upcoming execution. And then there's the, the detail that if you're pregnant, you get a stay of execution. So some of the prisoners are purposefully allowing some of the guards to, uh, to hopefully get them pregnant so they can live a little longer. We'll talk more about Josephine later. I, it's, it's good seeing more of her background. I still felt not enough. I didn't think it was enough for me to really connect with her. It's more dots, but, but no connective tissue between those dots. Yeah, le intellectually and emotionally, like you see these things, they're bad things. Not enough of a story, though, for me to feel like I get Josephine and that I'm on her side. Right. It is also like so quick because it's you meet Josephine and it's like, oh, my God, she's in prison 10 minutes later. Oh, good. She's out of prison. Yeah. Well, so that brings us to the end of the reign of terror in April 1794. We get our second Paul Barat and Napoleon scene. So after watching a bunch of nuns get executed, Paul explains to Napoleon that those in power are no longer popular and the guillotine has become a symbol of lawless passion led by Robespierre. So we then go to the National Convention and we see a ra that they are rallying against Robespierre and Paul calls for his arrest. Violence erupts. Robespierre tries to escape. He gets caught. He points a gun at them all, but it fails to fire. So he pulls up his backup gun and tries to kill himself. Is it bad to say those words on YouTube? Just don't say the S word. Okay. Uh, unless you say, he, unless you add the word squad after, then it's okay. <laughs> but he accidentally shoots himself in the mouth instead and survives. True story. That's true, yeah. right? Yeah. And it's the guillotine for him. And by the way, this will be known as the Thermidorian reaction, which ended the reign of terror and installed the French directory into power. Uh, one of the members being Paul Barat. So there's, uh, there is some stuff here that wasn't in the original cut that makes for a nice kind of parallel. So the scene you mentioned of all the nuns getting executed, again, you really don't have a warm feeling for these revolutionaries at all. Apparently, so in, in, in real life, they rejected you know, the official religion at the time, so much so they even got rid of the calendar and tried to make their own, where instead of weeks, you'd have these 10-day cycles. Every month is exactly 30 days long. So they tried to erase every remnant of religion, and that included killing a lot of priests and nuns and other religious officials. Uh, but what you see, so in the original cut, you have the scene that you described where they talk about the crowd no longer has enthusiasm for the guillotine, basically. In the director's cut, you actually see it because you had the Marie Antoinette scene where everyone's cheering, yay, when all the nuns are being killed and just singing these melancholy hymns right before getting their heads cut off. The crowd is just kind of silent. So you actually see that they've soured on all this. Yeah. And by the way, for more historical context on this, first of all, big conflict with the church at this time, obviously, right, is during the revolution, they're basically trying to get rid of Christianity. And that sets up a, a big conflict with the church, who was previously a big power center in France and in all of Europe. 
The other thing, right, going along with trying to get rid of Christianity is the French Revolution is just crazy, right? If you haven't gotten that feeling by now, is you think about the American Revolution, it was a political revolution, like we changed the government. But this is a total social revolution, like what was happening in like China or what happened in the Soviet Union, right? They're changing everything. They're even changing the names of the months, right? They are trying to change the entire social order. But that leads eventually to this Thermidorian reaction where the directory takes over and it's kind of a return to center. There are things that have changed, but they're kind of, they're trying to restabilize now. And that's around the time too, where Napoleon is going to take more power. Okay, well, so with the end of the Reign of Terror, we see all the prisoners being released, along with Josephine as well. This is one of the fun musical numbers. We have some cool French music playing as people climb over these gates, and Josephine returns to her home and is reunited with her kids. And in what could be a really sort of emotional scene, like I picture some of those like Les Mis scenes of like Anne Hathaway singing and stuff, and it's like, it's a real tearjerker. I don't know, I just don't really feel it for Josephine. Like you easily could, it's a good story. But it's just not enough. Like you, well, you don't really. Apparently, to her. they felt the same way because that scene was cut in the original version of this movie. The the reunion between Josephine and her children, uh, who you, I don't know that you even see them again the rest of the movie. You do, um, but, and you actually do see them as they age. Oh, that, yeah, yeah, it's true. And her daughter, uh, yeah, she has an important role, an important scene later in the movie. That's right. And her son is like around too, but just sort of in the background. Next, Napoleon meets Josephine at the Survivor's Ball in summer of 1794. And I believe that's basically Survivors of the Revolution is the idea. Yeah, apparently it became big in the culture after all that to sort of lean into the fact that we just lived through this traumatic experience. And I think Josephine became pretty big in the pop culture. She and a few other women sort of led fashion. And one thing they did is wear like a red ribbon around their neck to represent like beheading. Uh, and it, it was, I think, so there was some like morbidity built into their culture after that. And so they had these survivor's balls where it's like, we survived all that. Let's get together and party. Wow. So, and party they did. These were extremely <laughs> extravagant, loose parties with topless women playing musical instruments. And we see Paul is there having a good time, but Napoleon's a little serious. Uh, we see Josephine is with Paul uh, and Napoleon stares at her later on. She is wearing a very low cut dress. Uh, she approaches Napoleon and accuses him of staring. He refuses. Uh, uh, Daniel is admits... shaming everyone. It's topless women playing instruments. Instruments. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I did not say it with that tone. <laughs> so Napoleon refuses to admit he was staring, but then he admits it. Uh, and then he says to Josephine, don't tell me your name. We then later see Josephine and Paul in bed together. Uh, Paul says to her that he's going to pay off her debt from the evening uh, and he's going to give her some more money to keep her afloat, but sort of implies it's not a long-term solution. She should get to know Napoleon. Right. So that is the scene I was talking about. That was not in the original cut. And to me, that changes so much because I always found, uh, and even in the director's cut, I find very strange Josephine's relationship with Napoleon. And I think it was strange in some ways, but... I think from his perspective, it does feel like a weird kind of love at first sight. Like he is taken with her. I could never really pin down her motivation. And here she's essentially paid and then said, you should uh, get to know Napoleon, which I read as Paul Barris trying to get some control over Napoleon because he's friendly, clearly, with Josephine. And now he's and he sees that Napoleon has a soft spot for her. So Paul kind of sends her to go get to know Napoleon. That was not in the original cut. Seeing it here, and then it leads into their first date, it, it sort of colors her motivation a little differently. Yeah. With an ulterior I, motive. So I, th you know, I think there's a few different ways of viewing it. Like, first, I think Paul sees Napoleon as his boy, right? And he kind of is for some time. Right? You think about this, you know, he's rising in power and he, he's surrounding himself with people that are helping him rise. And he's also helping rise. And he is, he's bringing Napoleon along with him. And I think part of it is he's sort of looking out for him in a certain way, which is, and this is the other thing is, you know, Josephine is an important aristocrat. So Napoleon being with Josephine is actually helpful for his image and for his career. And so I sort of see this also as Paul sort of setting up Napoleon because he knows he likes her, but also because it's going to help with his career. Uh, but I think you're right. Like it's also to some extent trying to control things 
and, and have influence. The other piece of this that's weird, though, is, you know, it's it, it portrays Josephine sort of like a prostitute, right? Like she has money thrown at her. And I think Josephine's role throughout this movie is a little weird, right? Because so what? Like it's 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 Paul pushes her to go and seek out Napoleon. You know, I think she's also perfectly capable of choosing the guy who's going to rise and attaching herself to him, right? It, and mm-hmm. I think we see a lot of signs that Josephine is independent and that kind of person. And so I, I don't know, like her, her motivations and her independence feel very mixed throughout the movie. And I also feel like we don't get a clear image of who she is. Yeah, well, in, in the power dynamic between her and Napoleon, clearly she's the one that's kind of in charge. That Napoleon will kind of bluster and yell at her and stuff. But at the end of the day, she's like, you will always want this. And and he, you know, so, yeah, I, I think I'll say, you know, we'll, we'll kind of track the relationship as the movie goes. I think she starts to have an appreciation for him and possibly falls in love with him uh, by the end of their relationship. But at least at the start, uh, I think there's mixed motivations. I mean, at one point somebody asks her and she's like, I admire him or like close to admire him. So it's it's not a totally cold this person is, I'm totally indifferent to them, but it sounds like it would be politically good and it would just be good for me to go be with them. It, it's a it's a mix of stuff, but yeah. at least the director's cut adds one more variable, which is a monetarily backed recommendation by Paul Barris. Yeah. And so we see the relationship progress. So Napoleon and his brother are messing around in his office when Josephine's son shows up requesting her father's sword. Napoleon re- retrieves a random sword and shows up at their home and he meets Josephine. They go on a date together and Napoleon pulls her chair closer to him. Later, we see Josephine discuss with her maid that she does not find Napoleon without appeal. And perhaps that is enough. Right. That's the line I was thinking of. She then follows up and invites Napoleon over to her home. We see Napoleon is smitten. He rubs the letter on his neck. He smells it. I mean, he's he's in love with her. Uh, they meet. She explains to him that she tried to get pregnant in prison to delay her execution. He says it doesn't bother him. And then as classical music plays, she pulls up her dress and shows him, you know, her her personal area and says that once he sees it, you know, he'll never want to leave or something like that. Right. <laughs> you will always want to see it again or yeah, something like that. Oh, uh, yeah. that. So that additional not to keep harping on it, but that additional scene with Paul Barris saying you should get to know Napoleon. That also painted this in a different light because in the original viewing, I thought that her son genuinely wanted that sword back. And now I'm like, she probably asked him to go up to Napoleon and say, I want my father's sword. But really, she wanted his sword. Napoleon, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, and she also, she also kind of knows how to get to Napoleon. She specifically has her son say, my mother told me that you're the only man of authority who would be able to retrieve this sword. And she already knows Napoleon wants his ego stoked. Yeah, she is so perceptive. She figured out that Napoleon <laughs> has a large ego. I guess hindsight's twenty twenty. It's easy for me to say that now. <laughs> uh, I love uh, on their first date just how awkward Napoleon looks because he's still... A lot of Joaquin Phoenix's acting has to be sort of subtle from this point on because he's not showing any big emotions. But you just see a sort of like... He's trying to keep a straight face and portray confidence, but you see this like heavy breathing, like a hungry look that he he really wants her, but he doesn't want to show it too much. Yeah. The other thing I got from this scene that also shows up throughout is, you know, when her son shows up, Napoleon and Lucien are just sort of messing around. They're like tossing stones or co- coins or something in his office. Same thing. You know, he goes to retrieve the saber. They didn't label any of these sabers. There's countless of them. He just grabs a random one. To me, there's this air of cynicism and irreverence throughout the movie. I think we see it from like Paul Barra, who's like kind of corrupt. And we see it from Napoleon a lot. We see it in general from a lot of the leaders. And, you know, it's a choice. Like it's an interesting choice to some extent. I guess, I don't know. We'll, we'll see it throughout the movie. I'm not sure what to make of it, right? Because I do think it takes away from, like, surely Napoleon, this military genius, was also a serious guy who works hard, right? And yet, like, a lot of the time, it feels like he's just sort of bumbling around. 
And it just, I, that did not work for me. Yeah, it was very intentional because in that interview with the writer, he used the word irreverent like seven mm. times in the interview. Yeah, I think what the counter to that would be is that the positive side of Napoleon and just how powerful he was is sort of the theme in history. We already know that. So it's like they're trying to subvert it. But I, it just, it, it just feels like it gives you that shallow feeling of there's just stuff missing in this movie and you don't get a complete picture. And that's why you do get the feeling that Napoleon just sort of bumbled his way up to the top. Yeah. All right. Well, we have Napoleon's next promotion. This is the third and final classic Paul and Napoleon meeting. It turns out there's a royalist rebellion. 20,000 strong mob is planning to attack the council. Paul asks Napoleon, what would you do if I assigned defense to you? And Napoleon acts like he was just offered it. He says he'll accept, but he wants to do it his way. I will not lead a second in command. Cut to the insurrection. Bunch of idiots marching towards the cannons. They get blown to bits. I mean, there's even a guy that's already in crutches before, <laughs> before the cannons are fired. Uh, I mean, they just get massacred. And then Napoleon and his friends drunkenly celebrate. Uh, Paul quietly declares Napoleon savior of the Republic. Napoleon responds, I am just a watchman for our laws, for our republic, for the universe, nothing more, liberty or death. Yeah, whatever. Well, so the, uh, the insurrection where he suppressed it, uh, apparently he used grape shots in the cannons, which as I understand it, it basically turns the cannons into like giant shotguns. So it sort of scatter fires great against the crowd. Um, but this is another example where I feel like we gloss past some details and I leave this not, so this was a pivotal moment for Napoleon, right? A big part of him getting promoted because he did a great job suppressing this insurrection. Um, but where was he successful? Why was he successful? Was it clever tactics? Because once again, what I see in the movie is, Hey, there's a large crowd going toward us. How do we stop them? And Napoleon's like, shoot at them. Um, but in, in reality, I think this was sort of a crisis moment. He only had a few hours to act. And what he did that was so impressive is he took this bold, decisive action where I think most people probably would have had some moral, ethical qualms. What do we do? What's the right move? He just saw the right move, you know, debatable ethically, right? But he saw a move and he just took it. I didn't really get much of that from the movie. I, it didn't feel like a crisis moment. It was almost so casually discussed. Uh, it just, yeah, so I'm kind of filling in the blanks and I'm only doing that by looking stuff up yeah. online. It just doesn't land, which is another reason I think of the movie as like vibing, right? It's like I'm getting the vibe that like Napoleon's ruthless or whatever, but it's like, it's just a vibe. It's not a yeah. story. Well, it's, it's, the movie is great tonally. Like by the end of it, I feel like I get a feeling of the shape of everything that happened. And every time there's a battle, it has this really uh, melancholy, intense music over it that makes you feel kind of sick. And it'll, it'll oftentimes throw casualty numbers on screen. I mean, we can, you know, skipping ahead, but the way end of the movie, it kind of, instead of listing out Napoleon's achievements, it lists out the number of casualties in each of the big battles he fought. So uh, the, the movie conveys it through feeling that these, these terrible things are happening. Yeah, the we'll we'll talk more about that too. I think it's it was also it's interesting to put sort of all the blame on Napoleon, and this movie's about Napoleon, uh, but yeah, I I don't it, it, it fr that frustrated <laughs> me to be honest because like uh, it, it, there's there's a couple of bad like Waterloo, at least the way the movie paints it like Waterloo was Napoleon's fault, and, and it feels like you can make a great I, I mean. Uh, I mean, at least the way it's in the movie is Napoleon decided to come back and try and take France back. That is sort of the one big battle where that was purely his decision. But it felt like a lot up to that point, it was, it was conflicts that were happening and somebody had to take command and it was Napoleon. Yeah. I don't know that you could put all those deaths on him. A lot. Yeah. Again, Waterloo is a few hundred thousand. Or the invasion in Russia, a lot of people said don't do that. So he got a lot of people killed. But I feel like... It's, it, it almost cheapens the argument when you start putting those other battles on there. Where I'm like, that's that wasn't really his fault. I think I, I there's two main things I would point about out about 
that trying to blame him, right? One is the reason for the high casualty count is this is the industrialization of warfare. Like this is the first time you have serious industrial like warfare. So you got cannons, right? But you also have mass conscription. So that's the big thing that happened during the French Revolution is warfare used to be like nobles fighting each other, like small armies. The French during the revolution did mass conscription. You had regular citizens like in mass quantities going to war and other countries had to do the same thing to respond. So you just dramatically increase the scale of warfare. Like that's not Napoleon's fault per se. The other thing is you just had like it's just sort of like history happening, right? Is France has this revolution. Other countries are like threatening to intervene and stuff. France declares war on them sort of preemptively, maybe not unclear. They also want to spread the revolution. Like there's just a lot of stuff going on. It's not, I don't know that you can blame it all on Napoleon. Now, Napoleon then wants to go create an, an empire and stuff, right? And I don't know enough history to try to judge whether all that's his fault or not, but like, we don't even really see that much of it. Like, to be honest, a lot of the movie, it did feel like Napoleon was responding to things, but then like the dialogue implied that Napoleon is trying to make all this happen, but he kind of seems bumbling. So I don't get it. Like yeah. it just, the movie, it, it's if it's a, trying to sell that image to me, it didn't succeed. Yeah. There's a great line where he's like, look, I've never once declared war. <laughs> <laughs> so, I've never declared war on anyone. <laughs> the, the movie, there are certain points that are so clearly going for laughs uh, and it, it almost feels like... You think like, you're so cool because you have boats. <laughs> yeah. And just before any history buffs get mad at us, like these two idiots think Napoleon was great and he was benevolent. No, what we're saying is, let's see if you agree with me, uh, once Napoleon was in charge, my understanding is that he was pretty, like, I want to go conquer and take over a lot. So there's a certain point in history where you can start blaming him for a lot of death and destruction. Hundreds of thousands of people... But if you're listing out a bunch of stuff and saying it's his fault, and you include stuff before that, where it was more like, here's a conflict, there's going to be a battle, we need to put somebody in charge. When you include that as well, it sort of undercuts your argument. That's what we're saying. Yeah, I mean, the other thing too is, look, I think the movie clearly takes a stance on Napoleon, right? It says he's this super ambitious guy who was willing to kill 4 million people because of his ambition. That's what they try to do. And I actually, I don't, th I think the movie gives a vibe of that. But I don't think from a storytelling perspective, it actually succeeds in doing that. And then the other thing is, look, Napoleon was a complicated figure, and I would have loved for them to show more of that. He was definitely like a genius, right? A military genius. He also accomplished so many great things. I mean, he redesigned like all of Europe. He spread the enlightenment. He spread codified laws throughout France and throughout Europe. Like he just, he did a lot of things and we... And I know like it's it's hard to fit so much into the movie, but just my point is that they they make him very unidimensional and they don't even really sell the story that they're trying to sell, like the one dimensional story they're trying to sell. Yeah, I would say I walk away from this movie thinking Napoleon was an ambitious idiot that fumbled his way to the top and accidentally got like four million people killed. Yeah, <laughs> that's not my view of history, but that's <laughs> that's what I get from this movie. That's right. Um, okay. Next, we have Napoleon and Josephine getting married and the subsequent infidelities. So we have the wedding between Napoleon and Josephine, pretty small affair. We then cut immediately to Napoleon's conquest of Italy. He is victorious. Uh, he refuses to kiss the Pope's ring. He's toasted savior of the Republic at a fancy dinner. But at that dinner, we see the beginning of the infidelity. Josephine is being wooed by a man as Napoleon watches. Napoleon subsequently uh, makes love to Josephine very vigorously from behind. <laughs> well, that, that's where this gets played as a comedy because it's like him seeing her talk to this guy and sort of flirting, smash cut to just showing how insecure he is. Uh, it's, it's pretty funny. And yes. Uh, then, you know, this is interspersed with conquest. So then his conquest continues in Egypt. And he writes, now he writes his letters to Josephine. I follow in the footsteps of Alexander the Great. So as he's seeking this greatness and victory, Josephine stops responding to his letters. And we see her philandering publicly with this man. Napoleon increasingly becomes insecure until his advisor notifies him explicitly of Josephine's infidelity. This causes Napoleon to return home to Paris. Uh, I love that scene. I, I love seeing some of these awkward interactions He's like, uh, so Napoleon, 
which I, I could tell you anything, right? Yes. Even if it might uh, personally pain you, right? Of course. So your wife's uh, sleeping with another guy. And then Napoleon's like, ha, 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 ha. And then the other guy laughs too. He's like, ha, 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 yes. <laughs> Just a, it was a great and scene. Then, and then no dessert for you. <laughs> so in, t- in terms of Josephine trying to understand her, I would say at this point in the movie, it's, it's sort of hard not to only see her as a villain because just going off the information they give you, you see Napoleon fighting war and you just keep, it, the, the intricate is, Josephine, I need you. I can't live without you. I'm dead without you. You hear this voiceover w- cutting to images of her cheating on him. So it's just impossible not to feel like, wow, she's awful to him. And that'll change a little bit as we keep going. And I don't know if that's intentionally trying to portray things from Napoleon's point of view, uh, but it, it, it feels like cheating almost. They're forcing us to see it from his point of view by leaving out details and not showing us things that are happening. Yeah, I mean, and it's just she is she and her lover are just so blatant. And you will see later, like it comes out publicly and. And we we hear later also that, yeah, Napoleon also was like sleeping around. And, you know, of course, you know, we can we can condemn infidelity on both sides. Right. But like the way the movie shows it, first of all, we don't see his infidelity, but also, you know, at least from what we see, it's discreet. It's far away. You know, she is parading it publicly and he gets called a cuckold, you know, in the newspapers. <laughs> right. It's, yeah. It's it was bad. Like, yeah, that, that was my journey with this where I'm like, wow, she's horrible. And then he gets home. She gets home to find that Napoleon's moved all of her stuff out of the house and she gets all upset. He's yelling at her. And I'm like, yeah, you're so mean to him. And then 10 minutes later, she's like, did you have affairs? And he's like, oh, yeah, of course. And I'm like, oh, and that changes everything. I didn't know he had affairs. Like, am I stupid not to just have assumed that? But that to me feels like the movie. And I guess putting the movie aside, if you just asked me randomly, did Napoleon have affairs? I'd be like, yeah, probably. But in the movie, you don't see it and you only see her doing it. It feels like, uh, this is what I'll say. I felt emotionally manipulated by the movie. Yeah. And yeah, I'm not sure I, to what end. I, I want to better understand the movie's point of view on this, but let's continue with this and we'll pick it back up. So Napoleon returns home and it turns out Josephine's infidelities are in the newspaper. Uh, upon his arrival, she flees to Lyon to avoid him. Eventually she's brought back. Um, he confronts her. He berates her. How could you care so little for me and my feelings? After much yelling and demanding that she tell him he is the most important thing in the world and that she's nothing without him, we cut to a calmer scene at night where it flips. He says, he starts saying, I am not built like other men. I am not the subject of petty insecurity. You're a beast. I feel sorry to you. Well, I have to say, the again, the movie is like cut like a comedy at certain points because he yells at her. Say I am the most important thing in the world to you. Tell me I'm incredible and I'm amazing. Cut to, you know, I'm not like other men. You know, I'm not subject to petty <laughs> insecurity. <laughs> uh, and then after that, Josephine takes back the power. She replies with, the, or maybe she's always had it. Uh, she demands that he say, you are nothing without me. Or that. She says, yeah. you are nothing without me. He complies. I am just a brute that is nothing without you. And then he's, she says to him, you are nothing without me or your mother. Yeah. Or your mother. Where, where does that come from? That's not in the movie at all. Well, we do see her. We do see his mother later and she plays an important role. But yes. And I wrote here, we'll need to unpack these mother issues a lot. Right. So obviously, there's something going on here. We see she, him, her pushing him to be ambitious, all this stuff. But like, where did she pick that up? Like, I, I don't know. I don't think I don't think we do have to unpack that because for you and I to unpack his mother issues would be to go outside the text of the movie and go check the historical context and everything. But it's not in this movie. Like she's there, she shows up here and there, and there's this line. <laughs> but there's this. This is a great example of just the lack of digging into the substance in this movie. Yeah. Okay, wait, let's just talk about this relationship a little bit more between Napoleon and Josephine, right? Like, so what was her motivation? Like, why, like, if she just wanted to cheat, if she liked that guy, 
She could have done it discreetly, but she mm-hmm. didn't, right? She purposefully did it publicly. And then in the confrontation, she sort of sort of used it as an opportunity also to sort of like humiliate Napoleon and and assert her control over him. So is that what this is all about? All right. Well, before she um, starts having her flagrant infidelities while he's gone, before that, before he leaves to go fight war, she says to him, like, you leave and I don't know if you're going to come back. Like she, and she says it like a, a person who's in love and is concerned, like, I'm going to miss you. I don't know if you're coming back or not. Uh, so the it's infidelities could, yeah, it's punishing him. It's a little bit of, I want to go have fun and punishing him and I'm lonely. Uh, and I think, I, I, so what I was saying earlier, I think over time she grows to love, and again, I don't know if I want to use the word love or not, because I, I don't know if it ever reaches that point. But she grows to like him and enjoy his presence. Uh, but I think tragically, when that's at its greatest point is when they have to get divorced because he needs an heir, which we'll get to later. But but I think that's the journey she's on here. Yeah, just kind of... I don't think... I don't think the movie gives us enough. This is another area where I think we needed more. So he returns home just in time for a coup, which we're going to get into in a second. But first... Were to believe he comes home because Josephine's cheating and it just happens to be the right time for a kill? Like, historically, I gotta guess that he left Egypt and came back to Paris for the kill, right? Like, just, I, will I don't f- know. It's placing Josephine in a really weird position for running, driving the plot forward. Uh, I actually, I liked it. I was like, it's, it's clearly, it's taking liberties with the story. And if you look at history and there's a little bit, a mix of truths and you go with the more interesting one, but... I think part of what this story is trying to be is that Napoleon has these insecurities and this complex and the way he's positioned in history means that when he gives into those insecurities, it has monumental consequences for the world. You know, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people can die because of his insecurities. So we see this major decision is made that he abandons his armies in Egypt and decides to go home purely because he finds out his wife is having an affair. And then when people call him out on it, and he's like, let me, like, what, you, why did you think it was appropriate to come home? And he's like, let me ask you a question. Why did you think it was appropriate to let France come to ruin while I'm gone? That's why I came back. And you see all the time where he'll find a way to uh, misportray his motivations so they always sound benevolent. Like later when they ask him to resign, he's like, I understand. I just love France too much. That's why you can't take me. And I, if you want me to resign, fine. Uh, so as you said, when he meets with the directory, they accuse him of desertion. and He gives that reply. He accuses them of failing to lead France. Uh, he says the government is on the verge of bankruptcy and foreign invaders are on their footsteps. And on top of all that, I found out my wife is a slut. Yeah. <laughs> His words, he says. I'm quoting, I'm quoting. Uh, a few of those leaders are amused, including Paul Barat and another man. That other man shows up to speak with Napoleon later on, and he says to him, the only thing the French people can agree on is that you are our Caesar. There's some ancient Rome stuff there for you. Uh, He proposes a coup to displace the directory with him, this other guy, and Napoleon. And they all conspire, and they develop this plan. I love the coup, although I have some complaints about it, but it was fun. So basically, all the directors... Uh, guards show up at their homes and force them to resign. We get a lot of fun scenes. One guy just keeps yelling, I haven't had my breakfast. Uh, Paul Barat is cool. He's just like, I resign happily to, you know, noble, like ha- happy citizen or whatever. Yeah, I, that's how I would have been. Because I can <laughs> I can read the way the wind is going. Like, Look, do I want to fight this or do I want to just retire and have a good life? Uh, yeah. but again, like I, the, the movie plays so much for laughs and uh i mean that i'm finishing my breakfast guy and then when they drag him off and this lady's just like ah, ah, like waving her arms screaming <laughs> i don't know why this is meant to be funny but but it is i enjoy it well it's this again it's this choice to be irreverent and it's like you know this is a coup kind of a big deal but they make it irreverent it, so they make the subsequent parts irreverent as well so with the directors resigned 
They call the assembly far outside Paris to install a new one under the guise also of there being like a royalist conspiracy. So they have to do this outside of Paris. Like it's an emergency. The crowd is in an uproar, sensing a kill. And Napoleon provokes them. He rushes out uh, and he like provokes them to violence. They start kind of like trying to grab him, whatever. But he runs out. He's hitting them. He runs out screaming that they, they're trying to assassinate him. Unclear if they were trying to assassinate yeah, they're him. They're trying to kill me. Yeah. Uh, hysterical scene, right? Him running, bumbling around, falling. Uh, his brother's bumbling around with him. They're doing some improvisation too, where his brother pulls a sword on Napoleon. All this stuff. They persuade the guards to, you know, rush in. Uh, the representatives are all at gunpoint. And Napoleon says, shall we vote now? And yeah. the, the coup is concluded uh, with Napoleon installed as first consul. Uh, and then next, Napoleon and Josephine celebrate their new status and go to bed within the palace. Yeah, and so he, he's first consul now, which is an extremely powerful position, right? Yeah, you know, there's two other consuls too, but he's he's like the first man in in France, and very soon he will be emperor as well, and you know, fully consolidate his authority. Yeah, so happy ending. Got what he wanted. The end. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so now we move into the time period of the consulate. So we see Napoleon, you know, basically in charge now doing some politicking. So first he seeks peace with England, but they are not swayed. This is where we get the classic, I'm sure historically accurate line. You think you're so great because you have boats. Uh, he attempts to make an alliance with Austria, but that's clearly just for public opinion because everybody knows they're strongly allied with England already. He also tries to get allied with Russia, but they're closer with England. Ends up not working out. War can't be averted. They win a battle. To be honest, I forget which battle, but they win one. Uh, uh, the Battle of Marengo. Okay. Who was it against? Uh, they lost some. Um, this was against Austria. So they lost some territory in Italy to Austria, and then they went and they got it back. Okay. Uh, they win, and then his ambassador, Napoleon's ambassador, tells him that the European families look at him as a Corsican thug, so he should declare himself king. Uh, following that, he, you know, what he usually does after big success, he goes to Josephine, he makes some animal noises, and then they once again uh, have some vigorous lovemaking from behind. Uh, she also, an interesting scene, has him put his hand down there and <laughs> says to him, it's yours. <laughs> I think, I think people's uh, the most repeated parts of these podcasts will be just watching the ways you try and describe <laughs> these scenes. <laughs> uh, I think, well, a couple things. Uh, we, we get a few scenes of Joaquin Phoenix's performance when he's, you know, feeling randy, kind of like stomp his foot and, and sort of breathe heavily. Uh, and I think you see her getting more and more receptive each time. I think this is when they're spending time together and probably the point of the movie where I start to feel like she likes being with him uh, also that battle of marengo you mentioned in the director's cut we get a little tidbit that i really appreciated because one thing that we wanted more of is seeing napoleon the tactician and before the battle you see a big map on the ground and he's walking around on it and he's planning he says we will be fast we will, we will be swift and take what france lost while i was away and that was a big like that's what Napoleon was known for, right? If you look at his battle tactics, he was good at the surprise attacks. Yeah. He was good at being fast. And he was good at sort of dividing armies, uh, breaking them up on the enemy side. And this is the, uh, I, I forgot, this is where he follows in Hannibal's footsteps and he, he, he moves his army over the Alps into Italy. Hmm. Oh, you also see, this is another thing that was in the director's cut, not in the original. There's an assassination attempt on Napoleon while he's with Josephine. So he survives it, and then he executes this duke that he holds responsible for it. Uh, and I think historically that's looked at as a miscarriage of justice. And when he orders it, everyone's kind of looking at him like, don't you think you're being a little haste? So I think this is where the movie is starting to take the turn you know, into Napoleon's downfall. So what we said earlier about that insurrection he put down with the grape shot cannons, the thing he did is that he was decisive when everybody else in a crisis wasn't sure what to do. So being decisive can be a positive thing. Now we start to see where maybe not as much. 
Uh, so for example, executing somebody who doesn't deserve it, when people question you, no, that's what I decided, we're doing it. That's why for me, a lot of times I go to restaurants, look at the menu, I'm not sure what to order. But that doesn't look good, right? When you're sitting there waffling. So if I'm with a group, I always, within 10 seconds, I pick one thing on the menu. People are like, are you sure you want that? Yes. And then no matter what, I say I enjoyed it. Okay. Uh, next, we have uh, the sort of plot line of Josephine's infertility and the coronation. So we've had reference to Josephine's difficulty having a child with Napoleon. You know, he's multiple times said, you know, let that good work make a child after their vigorous lovemaking. Uh, also, you know, the fact she didn't get pregnant when she was in prison, despite her attempts. Uh, Napoleon questions her why she isn't pregnant. And then they have some uh, activities underneath the, the, the kitchen table. Uh, we then have Napoleon's coronation. Uh, a fun scene. Uh, in it, we have like Paul Barat looking on to this man who has, you know, risen much further, as does Captain Charles, who I believe is the man that Josephine was cheating with. And we have a very famous moment where the Pope goes to put the crown on Napoleon's head, but he takes it himself and puts it on his own head. And this is sort of symbolic of, you know, he's not letting anybody be above him, not even the church. My jaw hit the floor when he took the crown, but I was like, wow can't believe it uh next napoleon speaks with captain charles the new Man, scene I'm... for the director's cut and it's one of my favorite oh, it scenes was. yeah so i'm pretty sure i'm like mostly sure that this is the same guy that josephine was sleeping with uh and he basically asked him for advice on how to conceive a son because he is a man of notable coxmanship and basically asked him for advice on whether and how he should pleasure josephine to increase the odds of having a child is, is that important he, it's a it's a great scene. So yes, it, it is the guy that Josephine um, was was sleeping with while Napoleon was away, and Charles has a child of his own with uh, with his own wife, and so yeah, Napoleon's asking him for advice, and it's one of those awkward scenes. These are also my favorite scenes in House of the Dragon, when uh, like they'll come to Viserys to to report, uh, you know, what his daughter was up to, and he's like, just speak plainly, and he's like, she was in a pleasure den, and he's like, yes, and. Don't make me say it. And he's like, say it. I want to hear you say it. So this is a scene a lot like that. Uh, they're a lot less tense because Napoleon is very kind to this person. Um, so, so yeah, if you've seen the original and haven't seen the director's cut, I would say at minimum fast forward to this scene and watch it. Will, we're going to continue with the infertility plot line. It progresses further. But before we get into that, you know, there's these interesting things, right, where these these big historic moments happen and then something interesting sort of happens in his personal life, right? So he gets coronated, right? He is the emperor, right, of the French empire. Huge deal, right? And then he goes and speaks with the man who slept with his wife, right? And I guess there's different ways, right? Like, I think, first of all, I think, look, we see that man also watching as he gets coronated. Like, I think this is partly like, Look, this is Napoleon's response to these insecurities is he wants to be in charge and he kind of wants to rub it in this guy's face. But then there's also the sort of indifference of, but I also have this problem I got to solve. Like I got to figure out how to make her pregnant. So right? You cuckled at me? I cuckled at all of France. <laughs> um, by the way, we never see any signs that he follows through on the advice uh, no. <laughs> given, right? He just he keeps doing what he's been doing. But I think to your point of cutting back and forth between his personal life and these big important events, I think the movie does want us to think about how much are the two interacting with each other. So like you said, how much of him fighting to be king is me trying to impress Josephine or just trying to prove that I'm powerful? Uh, it's like I said earlier, these for you and me, if we're ever insecure, you know, we might lash out make a, a mean comment here and there. That's how it manifests. For Napoleon, when he's going through something emotional, it manifests as like, okay, another 20,000 people died over there. Hey, speak for yourself. <laughs> yeah, if you saw the pile of bodies, that's what we'll have that at the end of this podcast. It'll just come <laughs> up with a list of Daniel, 50,000, 75,000. <laughs> Uh, so given their trouble having a child, 
uh, Napoleon's advisor suggests a divorce, uh, which Napoleon, you know, kind of fights against. He's not willing to do it yet. Uh, you know, but the point is made, right? The security of the empire and peace in the world depend on him having an heir. At dinner that night, Napoleon demands that Josephine bear a child that night or there will be a divorce. Uh, we have a great scene where, you know, he says she's empty. She says he's fat. He goes, I enjoy my meals. Destiny has brought me here. Destiny has brought me this lamb chop. <laughs> Uh, and then he later sort of makes up with her in bed. Right. Yeah, that's what I say at the doctor. It's like, you know, cholesterol's a little high. I'm like, ah, de destiny again. Ugh. Again, the irreverence, right? Of, you know, Napoleon sometimes speaks of destiny seriously. This is an example where it's it's not. Uh, and Josephine kind of laughs at the destiny thing in other conversations too. Okay, we have the Battle of Austerlitz. So Tsar Alexander and Francis of Austria have amassed their army against Napoleon. He sets a pretty horrific trap for them. Basically, they think they have the high ground. They don't. They have a bunch of troops hidden on this hill nearby. It also turns out that the battlefield is, is just ice. Uh, their armies get massacred. Really cool, brutal scene. Francis surrenders to Napoleon, but Tsar Alexander does not. Francis and Napoleon toast a friendship, a glorious peace, and the best interest of Europe. Yeah, this obviously is just visually an incredible sequence. It's the one that everybody knew about before the movie came out. Even when they screened footage before it was released publicly, everybody talked about, oh, there's one scene with the cannonballs and the ice, and it's amazing. Uh, apparently, in his, historically, there's questions over how exaggerated these stories are. Like, it might have been a really shallow pond, and like one guy got his foot really cold or something. Maybe one or two people drowned, but you have to embellish. And, uh, again, production value is amazing. Great tone. Again, during the battle, it's not, the movie isn't leering at how awesome the battle looks. It has this very, like this, uh, doomed music over it. Like none of this feels good to watch. Uh, I wish some of the wrestling with moral and ethical complexity happened in the text of the movie and not just in the vibes of the movie through the music and visuals. Uh, that's what I kept thinking during these big battles is like, these are so good. I wish they were part of a better, a better movie. And like, I wish even just watching the battle, I wish I better understood within the context of the movie, the importance of this battle in the broader conflict. A lot of that just gets glossed over. Uh, and again, cause I think that's not what the movie's interested in, but I still think to some degree it's important. Yeah, I completely agree with everything. The other thing is, it still just feels a little too easy for Napoleon. Like, I don't know. If it felt easy for him to set that trap. I, I would have liked to just, you know, like in Better Call Saul, like they show all the details of every plan. I would have liked to see a little more work put into pulling this off. Yeah. Again, it's like if I can think of it, then it's just not impressive. Unless I'm yeah, like a brilliant like, tactician. Like, you know, like high I, troops <laughs> on the high ground and artillery there too. <laughs> fire at them from, from above. I mean... You know, there's, there's cannons over there. I was just thinking, like, have you guys, like, if we point them at the bad guys <laughs> and these big, like, metal balls hit them, like, really, <laughs> that's what they're for. You're a All genius, right. Napoleon. <laughs> we move on to the divorce. But your we ambition is too much, and that will be your <laughs> downfall. <laughs> we see Napoleon and Josephine having a fun time together at a dance and then in private. But then... Napoleon's mother sets up an experiment where he is to see if he can father a child with another woman, an 18-year-old brunette with brown eyes, and it turns out he's successful. Uh, so, the, you know, the conclusion is it's Josephine's fault. Josephine questions Napoleon when he is going to divorce him, and this sort of parallels uh, his story, I guess, with war, because he kind of acts like it's Josephine's fault. He says, oh, if you insist, you know, it's like he's not the one who's trying to do it, but, you know, she asks. Now, he tries to prevent it. He goes to the doctor and tries to get him to go along with a lie that the bastard child will be Josephine's, but he refuses. And that's kind of it. He then moves forward with the divorce. Uh, he says it's because his destiny is stronger than his will. Uh, this is at the ceremony. She sort of falters in repeating these lines. He slaps her and she goes on. 
Uh, and, you know, she says it's for the good of the empire, but she's still going to be friends with Napoleon. Uh, and, and they're divorced. And she, she moves into a new home and, and Napoleon visits her. Yeah, I think uh, she does not want to get divorced. I think that's why she's hesitating when they are reading out the decree of why this is all happening. Uh, so that's like what I was saying earlier. I, I think there's some tragedy here of they're growing closer to each other. And then maybe when they're at their closest is when they have to get divorced. There's really no way around it, considering his position as uh, he's the emperor at this point, right? Yep. Yeah. I also think I appreciated the detail that when they're going through the experiment of Napoleon has to bed this other woman to see if he can get her pregnant. He's very resistant to the task. Like he has to drink a lot to it. And then when he gets in, he turns off the lights. Like he genuinely doesn't want to do it. Uh, so this, I think, uh, from both of their perspectives, Josephine and Napoleon, when their love is at its most genuine is when they have to break apart. But also, I think Napoleon, he, he doesn't really, you don't really seem agonized over the divorce very much. Right? There's the one scene with the doctor. He tries to see if there's a way around it. It seems like once there isn't a way around it, that's it. We do it. And I think that's his decisiveness. The same one you see on the battlefield, you see it in his life. If there's no other options, I'm going to do what I have to do. I'm going to try and not portray that it bothers me. And I think it only slips out when she's hesitating. And he's like, I'm putting up with this. I'm putting on a brave face. You need to do the same. So you see, again, the decisiveness has its positive qualities. And then it has these negative qualities where it explodes out of him in this uh, violent moment against his, against his now ex-wife. So next we have a fun scene between Napoleon and Tsar Alexander. They're kind of like broing out together. They're like charming each other. And Tsar Alexander says, you know, he wishes he could call Napoleon brother. And, you know, Napoleon is trying to cement a French and Russian alliance against the British. And first of all, just a line I love where Napoleon's like, I just had a thought. No, sh should I tell you? You know that classic where you're like pretending to withhold? Uh, he paints a vision for Tsar Alexander of a grand army of the, the, the French and the Russians and the Austrians and the Prussians, like this huge army marching on England, like in the east and bringing Great Britain to heel. That and a continental blockade, blockade, like all this exciting stuff. And Napoleon wants to cement this through a marriage to Tsar Alexander's sister, but she's already betrothed to somebody. And then his younger sister is 15. He says it's details. details. Tsar Alexander... Seems unpersuaded. You know, basically this alliance ultimately is not going to happen. And what happens is instead Napoleon marries, marries uh, the Austria, Francis's eldest daughter, who's pretty young uh, and has a son with her. Yeah. Well, again, the movie's cut like a comedy because he's like, let me marry your sister when she's 15. Details. Uh, cut to him marrying the girl from Austria. Like these smash cuts. That it'll be Napoleon says something, cut to something that undercuts it. But that didn't work out. All right. So he marries the other one. And the other thing that happens is he brings the... First of all, when he holds the son for the first time, he cries. And he says to him, my little king. Uh, and then he shows the baby to Josephine. Uh, and she says to him, one day you will understand what I have sacrificed for you. Yeah. Uh, I, like, I feel it. I feel it because of the music and everything. But I feel like the movie just didn't show me her. I, I don't feel like I've been on a journey with her or really any of these characters. So, yeah. like, I feel like I, I don't walk away from the movie totally cold to it because I, I felt emotions. But it's like very broad emotions that I kind of slowly grow with the movie, you know, up and down. But there aren't any moments where I'm like, oh, there's no like gut punch moments. Like This should have been a gut punch moment. Yeah. So... Coming up, the invasion of Russia. So Napoleon says, you know, they, they refuse to ally with me. I, I have, now have no choice but to invade Russia. And in fact, sorry, Russia allies with the British, mainly because they're dependent on the timber trade with Britain. That's what makes Russia great. Uh, and so Russia picks their side and Napoleon invades. He assembles, the. I think this is where it's like the famous Grand Army, which is, it's a, it's a massive army of the French, the Austrians, I think the Prussians, you know, it's, it's Italy, many of Germany, their kingdoms. It's France, Austria, Italy, Germany, and Poland. Huge army. They invade Russia. He says, I see nothing but success in my future. 
but they fall victim to guerrilla tactics and scorched warfare where the Russians, you know, they're burning farms and ranches, like everything on their path to Moscow. And so we see their soldiers starving and they're freezing. They're really suffering. And when they finally take Moscow, we get the famous line. I don't know if it's famous, but the line from the movie that I really liked, he yells, you know, where are you? 300,000 souls live in this city and they've all just left. The Russians abandoned the city and then they burned it to the ground. Napoleon is left there with a starving, cold army without any resources. He refuses to go back. They had a chance to go back to Poland to wait out the winter, but he refuses. They march onward. His soldiers suffer and he eventually flees them and goes back to Paris, abandoning his destroyed army. And he is subsequently forced into exile for his extreme failure. Yeah, I love, uh, again, tonally, the, it all works great because you have, I see only success in my future. You hear these things that Napoleon is saying, trying to portray to Josephine, at least at first, things are going great. Like during one of their early battles in the invasion of Russia, he says, you know, he talks about having won a great victory and then it pops up on screen, French losses, 28,000. So you see it was somewhat of a Pyrrhic victory. Huh? Good, good Roman reference. That's basically when you win a battle, quote unquote, but you had such great losses, it wasn't really a win. Uh, and then again, just the, the music that plays over the battles and Napoleon rushing into the empty city. Uh, and then another one of these great lines where he tries to twist the situation to sound like, no, I'm in the right here, you know, because he's sitting there in this empty throne room in Moscow. Says, it's not very sporting, is it? You know, for his honor in Russia, it's not mine. There's dignity to be had in defeat. Like, they should have been here so I could have beat them. Uh, and so my view on Napoleon at this point in the movie, trying to understand in terms of his ability what it's saying, uh, my takeaway is that he's a brilliant tactician. You point him at a battlefield, he'll go and win that battle. But you have to pick the battle. Once it's up to him where to go and what to do, that's when things start to fall apart. Because clearly at this point, they missed their window, right? Because winter's coming in. Winter is coming. If we keep marching into Russia, we're all going to die. And that ends up being true. But he chooses to march on anyway. So a horrible strategic decision. Uh, it would have been cool to have more context because I'm not sure. I mean, obviously, that's a point where he went wrong. Going into Russia to begin with, did they have to do that? Or was that also part of his hubris? Uh, so that's where I think I could have used more uh, of just some decision making. Why are we going into, into Russia? What's the importance of it? What happens if we don't go? Um, but but overall, this this sequence worked at least tonally. Yeah, I mean, there, and there was there was a lot of really cool stuff here. First of all, th there's a scene. This is when Napoleon abandons his army, where a bunch of the soldiers, you know, they push their way into a barn during this horrible storm. And a lot of soldiers are left outside during, they're fighting for space in there. And then a fire breaks out and they all burn alive, trapped in this barn. Yeah, that also was only in the director's cut. So in the original cut, you actually spend very little time in the Russian winter. It's kind of like, we shouldn't go, it's the winter. Cut to, well, everyone died. And it just sort of gets explained. You get to the scene where the council is talking to Napoleon. Like, we sent you with 400,000 people. You came back with, like, 20,000. Uh, so I think this is one area where I think the director's cut's a definite improvement. You see some of the horrors. Uh, there's also a scene where, as Napoleon is on his way out, deserting the troops to come back home, he stops at one of the previous battlefields. And he gets out, he looks around, and he sees all the dead bodies. So you feel a lot more of the cost of going into Russia more than just somebody telling you here's how many people died. A few other things I love from this sequence. Uh, while his soldiers are starving and freezing, he declares to them, we are winning. You know, there's this like frustration and denial because, you know, the Tsar Alexander really is, you know, makes some brilliant choices here, right? Which is he's really subverting the way warfare is expected to be fought, right? He's refusing to fight Napoleon, and he's destroying his own country to starve out and freeze the French. And you do, like, you really feel Napoleon's frustration during this. This is also where his, his blustering about how great he is 
starts to sound so empty. Like when they're on their way back, he's like, he's sitting there freezing, halfway frozen to death. And he's like, this is a triumphant return. I am the victor. Alexander abandoned his city. And though he lacks honor and failed to sign a peace treaty, my presence back home will be proof to my people. They have no one to fear in the world. They fear you, majesty. They fear no one but you. Then he's, he says something like, I hope you die, Napoleon says to him. Yeah, <laughs> I hope the Cossacks eat you. Yeah. He just, it's it's another, they should have included that in the original movie because it, it would have been like, you think you're so great because you have boats. And then yeah. second to that would be this line. The way he just crumbles under, uh, well, once he's called out, he, he comes up with this framing of things to paint himself as the hero. And then as soon as he gets any pushback, he just crumbles into a child <laughs> with just the, the dumbest retorts. Yeah. Uh, a few other lies from him that show him crumbling. Right, He writes to Josephine, fortune has abandoned me. I am nothing without you. Call back. I'm scared and I am alone. Uh, he also asks the, his advisor when they're on that sled, do you think I'm a terrible person with a bad temper? He thinks, it's, like, it's, you know, he's thinking lowly of himself. His insecurities yeah. are coming through. Yeah, and uh, it's <laughs> uh, those insecurities that he writes into the letters. At, at one point, you see an article that some of those letters were intercepted. Uh, and then, of course, at the close to the end of the movie, after Josephine's death, he finds out that those letters were all sold. And so now they're all going to be out there in the public. Uh, just another thing about this sequence before we move on is, you know, this is extremely famous, Napoleon's invasion of Russia. First of all, uh, Tolstoy's War and Peace is set during this invasion, obviously from the from the Russian perspective. And, you know, this is also, this becomes a sort of like archetypal story, is always fear the Russian winter, right? Like, don't invade Russia. Because this, similar things will happen uh, when Hitler invades Russia as well, right? Like, that brings about his downfall. And... There's all these like interesting parallels throughout history, right? Like Hitler is fascinated with Napoleon's history, right? Hitler sees himself following in Napoleon's footsteps. Napoleon saw himself following in Alexander the Great's footsteps, uh, or sorry, in, in Caesar and in Alexander the Great's footsteps, right? There's all these parallels. And when Hitler invades Russia, he has a chance at one point right before the winter to go and take Moscow, but he doesn't because he doesn't want to repeat the mistakes mm. that Napoleon made. But there, there's a there's a good case to be made that historians have made, which is that, you know, the Moscow of the Soviet Union was very different from the Moscow of, of sort of, of Russia from this day, that Moscow was sort of the nerve center of the Soviet Union. It was centralized that if he had taken Moscow, the Soviet Union might've fallen, but, you know, because he was scared of sort of the ghost of Napoleon, he didn't march on. So just, I mean, as with a lot of things in this movie, it's just so cool seeing these pivotal historical moments portrayed, even if extremely inaccurately. Well, that's how it's sum up the movie. <laughs> it's it's so cool seeing this stuff, and I, I feel like we've been pretty negative on it. Just because if we were positive on it, it would just be us repeating ourselves over and over. Yeah. Which is, I love history, and so just seeing it rendered in such high quality and getting to immerse yourself in it for three and a half hours, it is fun. It's enjoyable if you're into that, but it just is lacking on the uh, fundamental story level. So we have Napoleon's exile to Elba. The tagline I have written here is Napoleon is left on Elba. Very sad. He's pretty sad <laughs> well, there. <laughs> it, and this is where they, so they tell him we sent you to Russia with 600,000 men, 40,000 returned. And that's when they hand him the paper to agree to his exile. And he says, I love France too much. All I've desired was its glory. I would never bring her misfortune. They want me to abdicate? Fine, I'll abdicate. Again, it's, it's your fault, you know? You know, and this is also him sort of sort of still acting like he has a choice, right? He, he's being forced to abdicate, but he's like, yeah, okay, I'll do it for the good of France. I feel like from this point on in the movie too, it feels like everybody around him is just looking at him like, yeah, sure, Napoleon. Uh, they just want to get him out of there. Just agree to whatever he says. Sure, sure. Let him think he's great as, as long as he leaves and goes to Elba. Well, yes, yeah. But that, you know, this is obviously his downfall. Uh, but there will be, you know, some some changes throughout. So he's on his exile in Elba. While he's there, 
all sad there with his mom. Um, Czar Alexander pays Josephine a public visit, and we even see it in the news. Boney's old bird caught out of the nest once again. Napoleon is extremely upset about this, and his mom says to him, you know, he doesn't like, she doesn't like seeing him all gloomy. And she says, you are not meant to die on this island, my son. And after 300 days, he has soldiers come pick him up and he returns to France. And I'll, I'll continue on with, with his return, but any reactions thus far? Yeah, well, he doesn't exactly get picked up by soldiers, right? He like steps onto a boat and says, hey, I'm taking over this boat. So you don't resist me, it won't be a problem. I think he has like a small group of soldiers that meet him and then they board this bigger boat, okay. but I, I'm not exactly sure. But either way, he's not far from France. Like they put him on an island that's very close by. Yeah. And when, when he gets back, we see he's welcomed back by a lot of people. So he has uh, people that are loyal to him. Uh, the scene of his mother telling him you are not meant to die on this island, uh, not in the original cut of the movie. That's in the director's cut. And it adds a little bit. So this, of course, is leading into Waterloo, right? This great infamous battle that got many people killed uh, at least the way the movie would paint it pointlessly uh, a lot of these people did not have to die and i think it comes out to like three hundred thousand people uh, and and the argument this movie seems to be making is that his motivation for doing so was twofold one it's his mother sort of reminding him of the ambition you're not meant to die here you're meant for greater things so he's looking for something greater and two the Russian czar taunting him by going to visit his ex-wife. Uh, so now you have you can add into the mix of things that are causing these massive waves on a global scale. Now one of them is the czar, the czar being petty. I'm going to go stick my thumb in Napoleon's eye by visiting his wife and getting that publicized. Napoleon's insecure, so he wants to go home and see her again. On top of that, his mother reminds him of this, I guess, ambition she possibly planted in him as a child so it's all these little personal things that lead to something major and terrible yeah and so he returns to france he kisses the sand on the shore he gathers more men as he marches towards paris he's confronted by the fifth army who are there to stop him but he ends up speaking to them i thought really cool scene and they just end up joining his side that uh, was a place i would have loved to see more because up to this point in the movie, I never really got a feel for how people viewed Napoleon. And it did surprise me. It's, you, you don't, it's surprising that he would have so many people that are willing to be loyal to him and go fight under him after such a horrible time in Russia. When you hear this guy got, I mean, what's that percentage wise? Like over 80% of his army killed. And now you're going to sign up to fight with him again to take over France. When you have no hope of achieving that, um, it, it's it's surprising, and it would have been less surprising if before this point in the movie we saw that people had like a reverence for him, and of course they would go fight for him again. Yeah, I mean, in general, this is we're not we're not seeing any of his skills, right? He has a kind of decent speech to these soldiers, but it's not really sorry. It's actually not even much of a speech, right? It's just writing on his reputation. He says, "Do you guys remember me?" Right. And they do. And we like we just don't see the way he's built all this loyalty with his soldiers, which, you know, he was very famous for. But we don't we don't see it. Yep. So they march towards Paris. King Louis the 18th is just a big <laughs> slob, uh, you know, just the classic sort of weak king guy. Uh, he's told that he's told Napoleon's marching on Paris and he goes more about the food he's eating. Uh, this, he this is like a part two to that. Like I'm eating breakfast. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so Napoleon's back in charge, uh, but he does discover that Napoleon was sick or sorry, that Josephine was sick and died prior to his arrival. He says to Josephine's daughter, do you blame me? I don't blame you. Of he course you don't blame me. It wasn't my yeah. fault. <laughs> I'm not to bear the burden of responsibility for the misfortunes of your mother. Yeah, uh, this is that insecurity of he he needs to make sure that everybody is thinking of him properly. Uh, and, and and yeah, everything's in line around him. Yeah. Uh, he also finds out that her valet had stolen the letters that he wrote for her and sold them. I mean, he's obviously, he's lost this woman he loved. Uh, and, you know, his vulnerabilities are all out there. 
uh, with yeah. his letters being stolen. And he gets everyone's into Joseph's know, bad. Everyone's going to know he was a loser. <laughs> All right. We move on to the Congress of Vienna, where we meet the Duke of Wellington, who I love, by the way, and I love him throughout the movie and his cool British accent. So he has assembled an army from England, Prussia, and Prussia on the borders of France and Belgium. Now, Napoleon is outnumbered, and so he knows he has to defeat each army separately before they can unite forces at Waterloo. And so he goes to face off Wellington uh, at Waterloo before the Prussian army nears. Now, he's waiting for the rain to stop, but the issue is that the Prussian army is getting closer and closer, and eventually... You know, he's out of time. Okay, fine. He just has to go and fight uh, Wellington's army. Now, fortunately, the rain has stopped. The battle begins, and it's really not going very well for Napoleon. A bunch of missteps. Maybe he would have won if if the Prussians hadn't arrived. Maybe. I think it's a little unclear in, in the movie. Uh, but the Prussians arrive, and his soldiers just, I mean, his army gets absolutely crushed, and Napoleon flees. Yeah, the way I read it, at least in the movie, is that at best he could have had a bit of a stalemate and sort of fought until Prussia arrived. But it very much felt like th this is the, the battle where we get the most detail of what's going on before it actually starts, which I think was necessary. So it builds that tension of you're waiting for Prussia to arrive. Uh, but also seeing all the details of the battle makes it feel very much like there's no shot at success here. And... I don't know, the guy that's uh, next to Napoleon, his like, second in command, keeps looking at him like, what are we doing here? So you know it's not going to work out, and it's just a difficult scene to watch. Again, seeing all these people die for no reason. Uh, this was the scene I alluded to earlier, too. It's also, I think, the battle where you see the most detail. And when you see the British kind of, of getting into formation as Napoleon's army descends on them, it all just looks really cool. Yeah, and again, I love the Duke of Wellington. He gives this quick speech to some of his soldiers. Now's your time, lads. Now's your time. <laughs> Patience is the order of the day today. This is a horrible accent. Patience <laughs> will win the day. I mean, but he just clearly, I mean, he exudes confidence. And he's just this sort of like gentlemanly British guy. And he's clearly in charge. Just like, you know, he's going to win, obviously. Yeah, and I love that moment where a guy has Napoleon in his sights. And he's like, should I shoot him? And he's like, No. We have better things, and generals have better things to do than kill each other. Don't shoot him on pain of death. Uh, and there is that great moment where someone takes a shot at Napoleon, and he just happens to turn his head at the right time, and it hits his, like, triangle hat. Which I guess you probably wear that triangle hat as, like, a trick. So people don't know, like, <laughs> well, I guess his head is a triangle. I'll shoot it in that corner there. <laughs> exactly. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of things in this battle. Uh, one thing I really liked... It fits very thematically. Is as Napoleon's about to flee, his like second or one of his like seconds or something. This marshal got this marshal. He yells to Napoleon like, "Your Majesty, Your Majesty!" Trying to get his attention and says, "Come see how a marshal of France dies." And he keeps yeah. fighting as Napoleon flees, and you just feel sick, right? It is you do see just all these soldiers dying, and it's stupid, right? Like they're gonna lose, like they're losing. Napoleon's fleeing. And there, there's so many of them are going to get killed. And I kept asking myself, why are they fighting? I, I understand why Napoleon is doing it, right? The movie tells us he's ambitious. He cannot uh, let go of the idea that he's lost and cannot be the emperor or king of France. Um, but the people, that's where it would have been cool to see more. Are they dying in their hearts? It's I am dying for a great cause to rule France the proper way Napoleon should be in charge? Am I dying because I'm dying for a great man, Napoleon? I don't really understand what's in their hearts and what's driving them, like this marshal, to be willing to go into certain death. They know they're going to lose, but they're fighting out of some kind of honor. But usually honor stems from something like the love of your country or I'm protecting my family. And I don't know what it is for them. I could look it up. Yeah, I mean, you know, historically, but, I, I, but it's not really in yeah. this movie, I don't think. Well, I think that's part of the cynical point of this movie is, first of all, I mean, I think it's like the nationalism, right? And and the French sort of enlightenment ideas and stuff. They're spreading them and, you know, the glory of the French empire. Like, there's a lot of stuff there. But, but you know, I think part of the message of the movie is, no, it's Napoleon's ambition. And these people, they're being manipulated, right? 
is what what glory is there really in this? But they're they're you know they're tricked into this. They have no choice. Who knows what? But really, it's all just Napoleon's ego, which you know also I think is not a fair telling of history. Right? Is you know there's there's these broad movements that are moving people throughout history, and maybe Napoleon's taking advantage of some of those things. He's also sort of a result of those movements. Um, but, you know, I, I definitely felt that was part of the message, right? The cynicism of Napoleon fleeing and these people fighting to their deaths, you know, for glory or whatever. Right. Be weary of quote unquote great men because you're following their leadership into what you think is greatness, but really they're out for themselves and they might just lead you off a cliff just to make themselves feel better. But man, I mean, it is just crazy. Like when you just try to reflect on things like this of just hundreds of thousands of people being killed in like a, in a maneuver between two different leaders. It's just crazy. All right, defeat. So uh, Napoleon is on a British ship. You know, he's been captured. Uh, he's got all the midshipmen or ado- around him who adore him. By the way, again, we don't really see why that is, right? But I know people were like obsessed with him, but she don't really see the charisma and stuff. But he's giving them advice and he says to them, how he's never made a mistake. But unfortunately, he can't get others to aim a cannon the precise way he would. He simply cannot transfer that knowledge. That might be what is most difficult in life, accepting the failures of others. He thinks he's going gonna... to... Uh, reminds me of our dad. <laughs> <laughs> but he says specifically, he goes, you know, it's very important to admit when you make a mistake. You know, I've never made one. So, uh, but, but I would admit it if I did. <laughs> uh, Napoleon thinks he's going to get to, uh, you know, enjoy some time in the English countryside, but no, he's never going to land step foot on British soil, probably because as he guesses, he'd have to get a trial if he went there. Uh, so he is instead being exiled to St. Helena, which is really more of a rock than an Island off the coast of, of Africa but not even close to the coast, like far away, I think. Uh, He says to the Duke, one must also not forget that I am only a man. He says, you forgot it, sir. You thought you were a god. I never said such a thing. Which is exactly what somebody who thought they were a god would say. (laughs) Because he didn't say, I never never thought that I was a god. No, he says, I never said it. (laughs) Basically telling you that's what he had in his mind, though. Uh, anything there? Shall we move on to his exile? And no, I guess there's the one movie. more note on that. Like yeah. the, the specificity of I never said that. It, it goes along with this whole theme of always wanting to portray things a certain way, right? Like uh, when he signs the letter of exile and he's like, well, I loved France too much. Like he just draws such a distinction between there's what I have in my mind. And as long as I say the right things, it's okay. And this is just essentially the last example of that before he's uh, left on this rock, casterly rock. So we are going to now talk about the final chapter, his exile. So we hear uh, Josephine's words, I guess, in Napoleon's head. She says, will you come to me? Will I forgive you, my sweet, stubborn emperor? I let you loose and let you come to ruin. Next time I will be emperor and you will do as I say. Uh, we see Napoleon all sad on this rock. There's a dead fly in his wine. If you remember from the movie, previously he swatted a fly when he was trying to broker his alliance with Tsar Alexander, but now the fly has got him. It's in his wine. Uh, there are two girls playing with fake swords. Napoleon gives them some tips. He tries to claim credit for burning down Moscow, but one of them corrects him. They're like, no, 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 the Russians did it themselves. Get out of here. Go, go play. Yeah, he says, leave me. Uh, And then we hear Josephine's words again. Can I tell you what I have waiting for you? It is a secret. And I will show you when you arrive. Come to me, Napoleon, and let's try this again. He then falls over and dies uh, after six years of exile and then lists the death count of each battle over three million dead. His last words, France, army, Josephine. I don't believe that. (laughs) <laughs> I just, I, it's I just, a weird uh, th- weird words to say <laughs> well also they didn't show anybody nearby when he died <laughs> so it does come off as wait, like wait, wait. who was oh m- maybe he passed out and then he was on his deathbed right <laughs> okay yeah because 
<laughs> the last shot of the movie is him, you know, this triangle hat, and he just kind of falls sideways. And I'm like, well, who heard his last words? But I guess, well, yeah, I guess we're two... meant to assume he, like, passed out, and then he, uh... Yeah. I was like, as he passed out, those two girls ran over, and he was like, France, army, Josephine. <laughs> I don't know. I guess we should have some insight insights on what this final scene means. He's playing, you know, these two girls are playing with their swords, their fake swords. Uh, and then what was it all for in the end? I mean, we already talked about the fact that it immediately cuts to listing out all the casualties. So it, it really paints Napoleon in a bad light. This is his legacy, is killing all these people. That's what he's good at. That's the tragedy. When he does a good job, it means more people die. Yeah, I mean, let's focus first on the the Josephine thing, right? Like, what is she saying? What What do you think this voiceover means? Well, okay, let's try and figure this out. Why don't you tell me what it means? <laughs> I, I know, I I don't know, right? Which is why I'm asking. But let me give some hypotheses, right? So, you know, okay. Here's my issue with it: is it's not like Josephine was a saint or something. I, but you know. Josephine had the power sort of in the relationship. We think he was driven by sort of his insecurity and wanted to impress her into doing all this stuff. And maybe her point is, look, like, and, and maybe the secret, what she has waiting for him is the secret is like, look, I loved you. You didn't need to go conquer all of Europe for me. If I had been in charge, I would have just let us chill. We didn't need to go kill all these people. I feel like maybe, maybe he that's, did, though. <laughs> yeah. It right? doesn't really it, land. I, I have to. I, yeah. If this were a different movie. Because I before- feel like she would have done the same thing. I don't know. <laughs> like, I didn't get this. Did you ever hear her say to him, what about the small folk? I never heard that. Did you hear her? Like, she was just like, I don't like you leaving me alone. I never heard her say, like, do you think it's wrong to conquer? I don't know. Yeah. No, <laughs> I, 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 it's, it, it feels like I'm hearing something that would have been really profound in a different movie. It just feels like there's so many things where I'm not saying the movie has to spoon feed, but it has to feed. There has to be something to chew on. And I feel like we know so little about Josephine that if this were, if I felt like there was something to be gained by doing it, I would have spent, you know, half an hour at some point this week thinking about those final lines. So I'd have some great insight here, but I need the movie to give me an indication that there's some insight to be gained. And not to say, I'm above it. I'm not going to waste my time. I guess that is what I'm saying. Just, no, how how would Napoleon think, put this? <laughs> Go ahead, Daniel. <laughs> no, but yeah, like I don't, I, I think it just doesn't land. I don't know. Maybe it's supposed to mean something, but yeah, I, I just don't, I don't think it lands. I tried. <laughs> you did. You did try more than I did. And do you know who the movie was dedicated to? No. Lulu, Ridley Scott's dog. That's oh. what people think. That's what people think? We don't know? Well, it said dedicated to Lulu, and people said his dog's name is Lulu. So we, I mean, it seems like a fair inference. But he's never, like, talked about it, and we don't know, like, if his dog died or anything. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's Napoleon. Daniel, I, I think you did a great job on that. That's good, because that means we can share the load a little bit. Remember that in Lord of the Rings? Sam, share the load. (laughs) Uh, But that means that some weeks, you don't know what you're going to get. It's going to be a surprise. Like Josephine said to Napoleon, wait till you get here. You know, you'll see what I have waiting for you. And that's going to be you guys. What's waiting for you? Is it me recapping, or is it Daniel? From now on, you don't know. It's going to be fun. Uh, so like I keep saying, uh, we're going to be doing this every week. What's next week? Oh, next week is big. Next week is uh, Metropolis. Megalopolis. Or Megalopolis. Uh, this is one of those few movies where I'm hearing terrible things, but I'm still excited to see it. And if anything, that makes me more intrigued because I'm just so curious what a big, beautiful mess this movie is going to be. So tune in. Uh, I think our, our goal is to release these between Wednesday to Friday every week. <laughs> Which I guess is pretty broad. That's 60% of the week you might see it. Let's just say it'll be well, weekly. Well, we're, we're gonna release them weekly. At least weekly. Generally around Friday, but yeah, we don't know when during the week yet, but we're gonna do at least one a week. Yeah, Some and we've weeks, done, even multiple. That's true. And now this, this episode will be four weeks 
And I remember in the documentary Super Size Me, Morgan Spurlock talked about how if you can do something three times, it becomes a habit. Because he was struggling to eat all that McDonald's. And he's like, if I can do it three times, then it will become a habit and it'll be easy. Uh, so I think we're at that point. So thank you everybody for watching or listening. Really appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you on the next one. So and please like, subscribe, leave a comment. Please share it with some friends because then you can talk about our talking about the movie with your friends. How fun would that be? And, you know, it would mean a lot to really support us in our work here. So with that, I've seconded on all that. And uh, with that, thank you for watching and see you, and see on, you the next on the next one take. One take. <laughs>